uh, e I, not yet, I guess we can see still the first uh, slide. slide. Uh, I guess. Uh, um, can I yeah. take under actions? It says take presenter. Can I do that? Yes, but basically, yes, definitely. Done that now, and I should find somewhere to share my presentation. Share your screen. Yeah, okay, we can we can now see your screen. Is it big enough? Because what I am seeing is very small. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe if you start the slideshow would be better. Definitely okay. better. So that works for everybody. And yes, I guess. So uh, before we start, uh, uh, since it's, it's uh, one minute past five, so I guess we can uh, try to start. I, I just have to uh, say that um, just the speech is recorded without chat, uh, just the presentation and the presenter, and when there will be a time for the questions, and everybody is uh, welcome to ask the question in a chat. Uh, but before we will, Costas will start to answer the the question. We uh, we will stop the recording. So uh, um, uh, let me uh, start with the official welcoming. Um, dear. Dear ladies and gentlemen and everybody who is uh, here present on this webinar, it's really an uh, honor to welcome Professor Kostas Konstantino, who is a distinguished member of the, uh, the pa faculty at the Department of Educational Sciences, University of Cyprus. He's recognized for his groundbreaking work in science education, in technology enhanced learning in science and teacher education. Uh, and I have to say that uh, Professor Costantino has left a really incredible mark on the academic landscape as well as uh, teacher uh, connections and teacher work. He, especially in Cyprus, he's very well known and teacher trust his judgment, his opinions and his uh, his recommendation. He has served as the president of uh, ESERA, uh, which is European Science Education Research Association, but he was also a member of the board of this association for, for many years. Of course, he has many publications that it's even hard to count. Uh, but uh, today we are privileged to have Professor uh, Kostas Konstantino uh, and uh, we we are privileged that we have this uh, option to share that he can share his insights with uh, us. So, uh, Kostas, uh, I would say the screen is your and uh, welcome, very welcome. And I'm also happy to to listen to this webinar. And so, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Kostas. I live and work in Cyprus. I work at the University of Cyprus. Um, Lisa and I have been collaborating for a number of years and what I will present is joint work. And I'm very grateful and very thankful to Elisa for all her support and her insight and all of her work. 
making the project as a whole a success, the Pafsi project, I'll say a few words about the project, but also this particular presentation. Um, what I am hoping to do over the next 90 minutes is to talk about um, the idea of inquiry-based learning um, in the context of socio-scientific issues and the importance of paying attention to student reflection and what that means. Um, the presentation is designed to present these theoretical ideas, reflection, inquiry-based learning, and socio-scientific issues, and to illustrate how they could be promoted, implemented in the classroom using particular topics as examples. So I'll give um, examples as part of the presentation. I think a large part of the presentation concentrates on examples. Um, before I, I, I'm very aware that English is not my first language and also for many other people in the audience, it's not their first language. So I will make a conscious effort to talk slowly. I hope that doesn't bore you or bother you. Um, feel free to interrupt, uh, ask questions, make comments, or just ask to repeat something. I'm happy to do that, and it's ha I'm happy to receive feedback. Um, this work is a small part of the PAFSE project. Um, it's an EU-funded project within the context of open schooling. Um, the project focuses on uh, public health issues and uh, connecting schools, teachers and students with their local communities in uh, exploring how to prepare better for public health risks, how to recognize public health issues, including um, epidemics like the COVID epidemic that happened over the past few years, but also issues like uh, traffic safety, um, navigating uh, the road, but also safety in our personal lives more broadly. Um, issues like nutrition, uh, well-being. Uh, so there's a broad range of issues that the PAFSE project is dealing with. It's now in its last of three years, and we are concentrating on engaging with teachers more broadly beyond our local countries. Um, the idea of this webinar is to introduce some theoretical ideas that are important in the PAFSA project, but also to say that um, we are in the process of preparing an online course for professional development for teachers on public health issues and how to promote inquiry-based learning and community-related activities with public health issues. And um, the secondary goal of this webinar is to receive feedback on the theoretical issues that are guiding our development effort and will guide some of our professional learning activities for teachers. Um, and of course, to put the message out there and hopefully find people who would be more interested in engaging with the project and in participating in the professional development course. It will hopefully be announced over the, over the next few weeks. Um, as part of the presentation, we will ask you to also help us by providing feedback. There is a structured online questionnaire. I am not very good with this platform and with the screen that I have in front of me, I'm not sure how to access the chat. But if I could ask Elisa to put the link to the questionnaire on the chat, I would be very grateful if you could do that, Elisa. 
and such so that everybody has access. It would be nice if before the end of the presentation you could help us by completing that questionnaire and give us some feedback that we can take into consideration both for the project as a whole. Um, it's an opportunity to find out a bit more about your own interests, but also for the professional uh, learning course that we are designing, things that you might find more useful or less useful um, and would be great to know about. So thank you in advance for doing that. Um, the presentation is divided into five parts. I will begin by talking very briefly about inquiry-based science teaching and learning. The acronym that we use is IBST. What that means, um, what the essential elements are, what the emphasis is on, what it's trying to do uh, for science education. I will then devote more time on discussing the content or what it means to be dealing with socio-scientific issues and why those might be relevant as contexts, as topics for science teaching and learning. Then I will move to discuss the issue of the idea of reflection and what, what that means and how it could be nurtured and promoted in the science classroom. I will bring all that together by discussing very, very briefly the idea of reflective inquiry-based science education. And then I'm hoping that I will have time to discuss a few examples of teaching learning sequences or of topics of teaching learning sequences that are already published and accessible. Um, just to illustrate uh, the ideas that I will try and use a range of topics um, to provide as broad illustrations as possible and hopefully to cover as much of your interest as possible. Again, feel free to ask questions, uh, to shout out, to make comments. It would be nice to hear your voices at some stage. So I begin with inquiry-based science teaching and learning. Um, I on this slide, I copy a description, an interpretation, or a, a definition, if you like, of inquiry-based science teaching and learning that I have taken for from the European, from the EU report. It's a booklet, it's a small book, on science education for responsible citizenship. And there, inquiry-based science teaching and learning is um, is coded, is formulated as a teaching and learning approach, and it's described as a process of sense-making and constructing coherent conceptual models where students formulate questions, investigate to find answers, build new understandings, meanings, and knowledge, communicate their learning to others, and apply their learning productively in unfamiliar situations. An inquiry-based approach in science education is one that engages students in authentic problem-based learning activities where they not, there may not be one correct answer. Experimental procedures, experiments and hands-on activities, including searching for information. Self-regulated learning sequences where student autonomy is emphasized and discursive argumentation and communication with peers, um, in parentheses, talking science. What are the main ideas behind this, this description? One important idea is learning in the form of active construction of meaning, active sense-making, and the outcome of robust learning in science is identified as the development of what it calls coherent conceptual models. Um, models in our head that we can use to analyze phenomena, to make predictions, to develop hypotheses that are workable in helping us uh, express our understanding of how phenomena work. 
Um, the second important idea is active engagement. Uh, a student in an inquiry-based classroom participates in activities and takes an active role. They are not a passive listener. An emphasis is not just based on um, students being active, but it's also based on students collaborating with others, with other students, communicating about what they are doing, engaging in developing arguments in support of what it is they believe to understand, but also gradually developing autonomy. Yeah, there is a lot of emphasis in this description on, on the emergence of student autonomy, of um, as the student grows in age and in experience in inquiry-based science teaching and learning, they, de they become more autonomous in what they are doing and how they act in order to develop meaning. Um, this report came out in 2016. Um, in um, 2018, Elisa, myself, and Olia Tsividanidou published a chapter that is called What is Inquiry-Based Science Teaching and Learning? And in that chapter, we analyze inquiry-based um, science education as a broad as a framework of principles for science teaching and learning. And I isolate here in the next two slides, I isolate the principles that relate to learning, to learning environments, to teaching and to curriculum. So learning in an inquiry-oriented classroom involves active engagement of students in the learning process. It involves epistemologically authentic procedures, procedures that one would find in the science laboratory or in a science community, recontextualized in the science classroom. It involves continuous social interaction and collaboration. Very little of inquiry-oriented uh, science is lecture-based. It is possible for a teacher to provide guidance and information, but the teacher wouldn't take the maximum, uh, the, the majority of the time in a lesson to do that. The majority of the time involves students working in groups, working autonomously, being engaged in planning and conducting their own uh, investigations. And inquiry-based learning is designed so that it responds to holistic learning objectives. In other words, it is not just about learning science concepts. It is not, it involves that, but it is not just about memorizing facts, uh, even though phenomena are important. It involves, um, as a matter of priority, it involves a combination of goals that relate to the philosophy of science, to the nature of science, to the practices of science, the competencies that students need to develop. Argumentation came up already. Systems thinking will come up in subsequent slides. Uh, investigation, problem solving are important competencies that scientists develop and use in their daily practice. Scientific values and attitudes, and of course, the need to nurture, to help students develop conceptual understanding that they can then use in uh, unfamiliar situations. An inquiry-oriented learning environment is designed to promote construction of meaning, the gradual development of competencies, and an awareness of the nature of science. And it includes assessment as a feedback tool, as a tool to support student well-being and student engagement with the activities. It also uh, provides assessment in an inquiry-oriented learning environment, provides feedback to the teacher and feedback to the curriculum designer about how to respond to the student needs and how to improve the activity sequence and what is happening as part of the learning process. Curriculum materials 
are designed as a scaffold to guide the learning process. They are a tool that supports the teachers, the students, and the interactions between them and, be and between the students within their groups. They are designed usually and validated through a process of research. So there is an important role for science education research in developing inquiry-based curriculum materials if they are going to be effective. That involves usually collaborative processes between researchers and teachers in enacting, evaluating, and refining the curriculum materials until they become effective. Um, and teaching also adheres to important characteristics. For example, the teacher adopts the role of a facilitator and aims to provide an example of an inquiring person. In conventional, traditional classrooms, a teacher adopts the role of the expert. A teacher is the adult in the room and they represent the discipline. A, a, a biology teacher is the local in-class representative of uh, biology as a discipline. In an inquiry-oriented classroom, it is important to have an adult around. It is also important to have access to expertise, but the teacher is not the only and usually is not the main representative of the expert discipline. Um, the teacher is mostly there as a facilitator, as a support uh, agent, and as a model for a person who can make mistakes, can acknowledge that they don't know everything, can model how we learn from formulating questions and we collect information in order to develop answers. So they become an active part both in supporting but also in promoting the student inquiries. So the teacher does not function in the eyes of the students as the only bearer of expert knowledge. There are so many sources of knowledge that are accessible to students nowadays that it is important for teachers to move away from that role and model much more important roles, such as an inquiring person, a skeptical person, a person who places value and emphasis on the use of scientific evidence in supporting claims or making our assertions more scientific. And teaching also relates to motivation, sustaining the emotional engagement that students need for the long term in order to benefit from science learning, uh, sustaining effort on a continuous basis in order to be in a position to engage with the activities so that they can accumulate knowledge. So those are important roles for the teacher, a facilitator, a guidance, a support, an inquiring role model, but also uh, supporting the emotional engagement of students with the learning. That's all I had to say about inquiry-based teaching and learning. It is a theoretical framework that is designed to offer principles, both design principles and practice principles, for making science teaching more authentic than was conventionally possible. If you have questions, this is a good time for me to pause or any comments that you might have. Sometimes inquiry-based science teaching and learning is um, confused with discovery learning or with experiment, doing experiments. Uh, as long as students are doing laboratory work, many people feel that they are doing inquiry-based uh, teaching and learning. And it's, it's not about that. Uh, it's, uh, active engagement is important. But the important thing is presenting a holistic, authentic, um, a representation for how science works and engaging students in a um, in an inspired process of making sense of developing meaning about how phenomena around them work um, in a way that is personally fulfilling and engaging engages them in a process of professional intellectual growth 
I want to move to the second part of the uh, of the presentation and talk about socio-scientific issues uh, as topics, as contexts for inquiry-based science teaching and learning. Um, why talk about issues? But what is an issue? An issue is a topic with no clearly defined single outcome or answer. Something about which reasonable people might be expected to disagree. This is a quote from uh, Louis in uh, Wisconsin, Susan Lewis in Wisconsin. Um, and I, I think it identifies uh, a couple of the important features of issues that might be valuable as teaching topics. One is that um, it's not it's not an exercise. It's not uh, a formulation of an exercise so that students engage with it for a few minutes, a few hours, or a few days in order to come up with a correct scientifically valid answer. An issue is a topic that is open to more than one interpretations and answers. There's a number of options that one can take with respect to an issue. And one option might be better or worse than another, but it's not an issue of correct or wrong. And it's not necessarily better or worse. There might be arguments in favor of, of more than one option. And the whole value of engaging with issues is engaging with the process of um, balancing between priorities in order to make up our minds about issues that are not black and white, about choices that we all have to make that are not clear-cut, that are not right or wrong, that are open-ended, that other people might make. We can imagine somebody else uh, making another choice and it may work out better for them. Um, or for their community, or at least as well as our choice might work for ourselves and our communities. What are socio-scientific issues? They are real-world problems, uh, usually problems that a community or society more broadly is discussing at the moment, that have an aspect at least that requires some scientific understanding. So grappling with the issue, understanding the issue, making sense of the issue, understanding what the options, the choices might be, and how to arrive at an optimal choice requires some understanding of the, of the background science that relates to that issue. Hence the term socio, it has social relevance, it is of interest to a community or a society, and scientific, it requires some scientific understanding in order to grapple with the issue. Um, it might be controversial in the sense that there is no clear-cut issue. Um, and because it's a contemporary topical issue, there might be people who have strong opinions about different options with, with respect to that issue. So it requires, in some ways, taking a step back collecting the evidence and organizing the evidence before you can uh, express a considerate uh, viewpoint or make an informed choice. They might include an ethical component, uh, sometimes moral dilemmas uh, relate to socio-scientific issues. And they are very uh, alive, they, they, they are both contemporary and topical, but also they have some relevance to the students' communities, their everyday lives, the things that they might talk about at home. They are ill-defined, they are laden with values, uh, they might invoke aesthetic, ecological, economic, moral, educational, cultural, religious, and recreational uh, aspects, and they would be constrained by missing knowledge. So there would be a sense that um, if you're going to make an informed decision or an informed choice about a socio-scientific issue, you need to have the information, you need to have the scientific evidence in front of you. The, over more than a decade or so, socio-scientific issues have attracted a lot of attention in the 
in science education and in the teaching learning of uh, science. And the idea is to find ways to make science teaching and science learning more relevant to student lives in order perhaps to increase the level of interest and the engagement on the part of the students and their families with the extended period of time that is required to develop robust knowledge, to develop coherent conceptual understanding of a particular topic. Um, I have copied here a table from an article by Linda Schenk back in, uh, back in 2021, so three years ago. And I like this table because it gives an analysis of the different topics that have been raised in the science education research literature as topics um, of choice for socio-scientific issues. So issues related to the environment, the conservation of nature, uh, issues related to biotechnology, for instance, genetic engineering, cloning, uh, genetically modified food, issues related to nutrition, issues related to climate, including climate change, adaptation, um, prevention of uh, climate change. Um, nuclear power is currently attracting a lot of attention for the possibility of using more nuclear power in electricity generation to uh, mitigate climate change. Uh, but more broadly, the idea of ionizing radiation and risks that are presented to human health from ionizing radiation. Uh, there's a whole group of issues there. Chemicals and human health, uh, the substances that we use in industrial processes or in production, manufacturing, even in, um, in the food industry and how they might impact on this kind of health. Uh, energy sources and modes of uh, making energy available to meet our needs, including sustainable energy sources or alternative energy sources. That's another uh, group of uh, issues relating with, with a socio-scientific uh, background. Uh, consumer choices, how we engage with um, different products that we purchase and consume, um, how they impact sustainability, the environment, our health also. The issue of packaging at the moment uh, is important in dealing with the environmental impact of plastics and also with um, uh, waste disposal and its implications on climate change. Um, I mentioned already public health. This table places emphasis on sexual health, including sexually transmitted diseases. Electromagnetic radiation, non-ionizing radiation, mobile phones, uh, overhead power lines uh, have attracted attention, um, potential health hazards that relate to those. That's another set of um, socio-scientific issues. Um, so this is, a, this is a grouping of topics that you can find literature on, and in some cases you can find uh, teaching and learning resources and materials for use in the classroom. Another way of approaching this to identify examples of socio-scientific issues is to look at um, scientific journalism, either in specialist media. Uh, there are uh, science-based websites uh, or in broader uh, public media such as the Guardian, the, the Guardian newspaper in the UK, the Economist is an international newspaper or magazine that uh, has a section on science and technology issues. The BBC is another portal that uh, functions to disseminate news and it has a strong emphasis on, on science and technology. And they are doing some interesting podcasts, the BBC News, sorry, Science Series is an interesting uh, podcast series. So um, in media like that, over the last few years, you will have met issues relating to COVID-19 um, and the variation of policy responses to the pandemic. 
Um, in former years, there was a big controversy over the last 25 years now about squirrels, especially grey squirrels in the UK. There was a national program to cull, to kill grey squirrels uh, because they were carrying a, a virus, a pox, that could be transferred to other um, animals. There was the claim that they, it could be transferred to other species and it was fatal. But in recent years, uh, controlling the population of grey squirrels has become um, uh, very fashionable for people who would like to protect the indigenous, indigenous in the UK, red squirrel. Um, Apparently, the grey squirrel is an invasive species. It tends to spread and take over, and it thrives in local communities. It drives the red squirrel. It dominates, basically, both the habitat and the food supply. And it carries a, a virus that affects the red squirrels and does not affect the grey squirrel. So it communicates disease, basically. And it gradually um, helps to extinct the red squirrel. So there is um, the controversy in the UK, should the government fund programs to kill grey squirrels in order to reduce their impact on vegetation, help the farmers, but also protect the red squirrels. The science behind that is controversial, interesting to look at. Um, there are uh, a few learning environments, including um, one version by Maria Eva Goro and myself on the WISE platform, another version by Maria Eva Goro and her own a number of years ago. So some interesting uh, sequences around this socio-scientific issue. Um, issues like uh, banning on smoking, uh, that is now, I think, uh, already the case throughout the EU, other countries are still grappling with this issue. Um, but it's one example that relates to diet or relates to uh, human health. Um, another example that has been in the public media since the early 70s was the controversy around the addition of fluorine in public water supplies um, in order to help with um, dental, uh, so the health of teeth, especially for children. Um, the other side of the coin is whether there exists scientific evidence that there might be long-term detrimental effects of uh, fluorine to human health. Again, the scientific evidence is interesting on that issue. Um, there is, in human nutrition, there is a, a, an interesting topic related to, relating to consumption of sugar, consumption of, of fats, and consumption of uh, proteins, and different constituents of diet that would be healthy or unhealthy. Again, the science is, is complex and interesting and accessible to students, and that's a topic that many students in middle, middle school find interesting. Um, many variations on the greenhouse effect and uh, global warming are um, pretty much prevalent in the media because we are finding it difficult to develop sustainability policies that mitigate global warming to the extent that is required, at least based on the scientific modeling that is available and based on the international panel that of scientists that was that is organized by the united nations and produces the periodic reports um, issues like the role of insects in the future of human nutrition and how that might help with global warming those can be very popular with boys in middle school um, but also issues relating to the use of antibiotics and the risks that come with microbial resistance. Um, all over Europe, um, over the last several years, there is increasing intensity in the incidence of um, um, microorganisms that cause disease 
both in hospitals and outside hospitals that are resistant to antibiotics and for which we don't have any cure. Um, if you take a step back, basically you realize that um, there are two competing processes. One is scientific research on the development of um, antibiotic and antiviral um, medications. And there is extensive research over a number of years that is needed. And if we are lucky, we develop the next generation when the microbes appear and we deal with the situation. If we are not lucky and we fall behind the genetic mutations of viruses and bacteria, we run the risk of, um, of dealing with a public health epidemic, um, either with a, a bacterial disease or with uh, viral infections. And uh, overusing antibiotics or using antibiotics in situations where they are not necessary or not needed. Uh, to give you an example, we are still using antibiotics in hand washing liquid, which basically means that we have uh, antibiotics prevalent in the home all the time, and we are encouraging bacteria to mutate, to evolve, in ways that develop resistance to antibiotics, so that when we really need them to fight the disease, they are not, the antibiotics are not adequate. Um, the European Commission is currently funding a huge uh, Europe-wide campaign to make more people familiar with this issue and sensitize people to the idea that we should not be storing antibiotics at home, we should use antibiotics following medical personnel's advice only, uh, only with prescriptions. We should not use other people's medication. Um, we should uh, be patient with infections like influenza and not, be, not use antibiotics to deal with the symptoms. Um, there are scientific reports that are published at European level that also make interesting read and provide scientific evidence. They are accessible to teachers and students, and there is room for development of teaching learning materials using this issue. Again, public health issue that is of great interest to many communities. I live in a country that has a particular problem, partly because in Cyprus we have a lot of tourism, because the, uh, the population goes up and down in particular months, and people bring their own medications, it's difficult to register the use of medication. So the statistics is not always as reliable. Monitoring the local use of antibiotics becomes more difficult than is typical in more countries, in other than is typical in other countries. But also in our hospitals, we have um, antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria, uh, microbes coming up a lot, and we have a particular problem with the use of antibiotics in uh, animal, in, in the development of animals for uh, nutrition, for food. Um, it's a particular problem in Cyprus with poultry. Uh, so there are specific guidelines about how we need to uh, treat or not treat, and how we need to clean poultry before we cook it, and so on. It's a problem in every country in Europe. It's a, it's a problem of bigger intensity. It happens to be a problem of bigger intensity in Cyprus. And so there's an intensive public campaign to deal with this issue. Um, uh, the issue of cannabis is attracting a lot of attention in some countries and medicinal use and recreational use of cannabis. There are, there's a lot of evidence either way. Again, it's interesting. Exploration and um, um, provision of fossil fuels is another issue. Drought, flooding, again, um, or climate change more broadly and the different phenomena there, that's another issue. Again, if you have any comments, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, I've, give, I've given you some examples of issues that might be of interest to explore in a classroom. 
I want to step back and say that socio-scientific socio issues that are interesting for teaching and learning purposes often embed evidence of cognitive and moral dissonance. If you apply different values, you arrive at different options. And actually going through a, method a methodical process of placing, uh, prioritizing the different values, uh, the different criteria for evaluating options is an interesting and useful and productive exercise for students. Um, these issues, uh, when chosen properly for the appropriate age, they offer contexts in which scientific evidence, real-time data collection, the analysis of uh, the data, the interpretation of the evidence, and the investigation become entangled with other aspects of our daily lives, including community priorities, economic priorities, and political decision-making, and ideology. And socio-scientific issues often highlight situations where a public understanding of science is extremely important to decisions that might actually be life and death, not always, to crucial decisions at a number of levels, global, supranational, national, regional, and personal, uh, for example, health-related uh, dilemmas. And um, it's interesting to think about controversy um, and what the sources of controversy are in dealing with socio-scientific issues. Uh, in this slide, we identify two distinct types of controversy. On the left-hand side, the issue is um, the issue is controversy relating to social, economic, ethical, ecological, political aspects uh, of the topic. For example, in this case, um, there would be scientific consensus about what the favored options should be, but there are, there are other interests amongst stakeholders in place that um, push other priorities that make other options either preferred or viable and these have to be weighed against each other and to really understand the risks, the costs, the benefits before we can arrive at a personal standpoint with respect to the controversy. So the broad idea here is the science is settled, there is consensus amongst the scientific community, but other stakeholders are promoting different interests that are prioritizing other uh, options. One clear example is the fossil industry at the moment with respect to climate change. Another aspect of controversy that is equally important and equally interesting for treatment in the science classroom is controversy in science. Um, when the science is not settled, when science has not reached consensus, either because there are competing theoretical hypotheses within the scientific community and different scientists are prioritizing uh, hypotheses that are not compatible with each other, or a second reason might be that there is insufficient evidence or the capacity, the instrumentation, the uh, access to the phenomenon are not there to make data collection possible in order to arrive at uh, an, anywhere close to the uh, evidence being sufficient in order to arrive, in order to compare between competing hypotheses and arrive at some consensus. Um, if you look at historically relevant uh, controversies, including on scientific issues. One example is the, the age of the Earth and uh, the issue of continental drift in, uh, in uh, geology. That's, that's another issue. That's an issue from the history of science. Um, and that's quite distinct from socially relevant uh, issues that are contemporary and contain a science background that we would term socio-scientific issues. Um, controversy is an interesting feature 
in socio-scientific issues and it makes them more exciting um, it makes them more relevant sometimes to student eyes and it increases the level of engagement um, some examples that uh, have been controversial in the public domain uh, causes of global war warming have been disputed even by some scientists not anymore uh, the long-term effects of uh, genetically modified organisms including genetically modified food nanoparticles uh, the long-term effects of the use of AI in education is currently very controversial. Brain stimulation for neurological disorders is an experimental treatment, again, uh, part of the controversy around the scientific basis. Um, and from a social perspective or from the perspective of uh, stakeholders, Issues like G therapy, nuclear energy, geological risks, vaccination, stem cells, um, all of those uh, attract a lot of debate and a lot of controversy in the public domain, even though it would appear that the scientific background is, is settled and there is consensus in the community about all of those. And just to give one example, um, uh, it's interesting to think about droughts. Uh, I live in a country that um, in the summer gets very hot because we are an island, we don't get a lot of rainfall. And partly because we, for, we've developed a large part of the island, we don't have as many forests as would be needed to prevent erosion. So, um, Safeguarding enough water for human consumption to meet the human consumption needs it's a, it has been a challenge in Cyprus since the mid-70s. And we also like to support local agriculture, so safeguarding enough water to support local farming is an additional challenge. The result, the outcome of that discussion was anywhere we could build a dam, we have done that. So we have about, for in the mid 80s and 90s, there was a public slogan, not a drop to the ocean. So the idea was to build enough dams to collect water um, everywhere possible so that not a drop of uh, rainwater would get to the sea the environmental impact of that is not so positive uh, we have about 55 dams in cyprus but we have disrupted all of the um, fishing reproduction sites and we have created a lot of um, a lot of damage to plant habitats also usually downstream we have flooded whole areas in some cases of great of great um, um, historical uh, value and archaeological value in other cases of great ecosystem value that's our local uh, problem we've gone beyond that and we are now um, in the process over the last 15 years of developing desalination plants that use a process called uh, reverse osmosis to uh, convert salt water from the sea into drinking water uh, and they return water with more than double the salinity back into the marine ecosystem the science behind the environmental impact of that is not very clear uh, and is studied in Cyprus also, it's also a controversial issue in the public domain amongst environmental um, activists. And of course, if I broaden away from Cyprus, um, the whole issue of water and conservation of drinking water relates to not just farms and uh, local communities, but also industrial use of water and monitoring the changes in rainfall um, the cycles are becoming more extreme it seems due to climate change and so 
in Europe we have regions of drought and we have regions of flooding, sometimes in the same place within space, time difference of one, two years. We are becoming more familiar with uh, extreme weather events. Um, and because of that, because it's becoming a bigger risk, um, meteorologists are producing a lot. Well, the instruments have also been improved quite a bit, so the technology is there. But meteorologists are also producing a lot more data and making it public. So in Cyprus, in a number of stations across the island, we have public access to all sorts of data, including temperature rainfall, all sorts of climate data, but also um, uh, data on air quality and water quality. And it is possible to use data and simplify it, pre-select it, and make it accessible to students and organize student inquiries, including on issues like how do you design a more sustainable water policy for the future and what have we done wrong in the past what are the what is the damage out of the past policy and what can we learn from past mistakes to improve our policy those are in, interesting topics for classroom use um, socio-scientific issues can be very very valuable in the science classroom for nurturing students' competencies. So one example of a competency is systems thinking. A system is a group of related parts that make up a whole and can carry out functions its individual parts cannot. Um, so a, a system both in nature, in science, but also in society is identified as an entity made up of different constituent parts that demonstrates a behavior, demonstrates some function that is not observable, that cannot be demonstrated by, the, by any group of the individual constituent parts. Um, in the limiting systems, in identifying systems, in science at least, the intent is to make the study of the system manageable. So there is some level of subjectivity in identifying a system. Investigators usually recognize that the defined system may interact with other systems, so it might be a part of a bigger system, but it may also have subsystems. Um, so we make choices about the system that we want to investigate with the purpose of making the investigation uh, manageable. And just to give you an example that um, might be useful in even for in elementary uh, school science education. Uh, a plant can be thought of as a system. It has component parts, stems, leaves, roots, that make up the uh, plant organism. And the plant can carry out a number of functions, actually, that each of the individual parts or any group of the individual parts that doesn't include everything that makes up the plant, cannot uh, demonstrate, cannot carry out. Uh, some examples, the plant inputs carbon dioxide, water, and minerals from the ground usually, and through the process of photosynthesis, for instance, it produces oxygen and sugar. There are other processes or mechanisms that uh, one can study in a plant transport mechanisms, um, respiration, photosynthesis. Um, the plant system, of course, interacts with other systems. Uh, for example, the hydrosphere. A plant is usually a part of a broader habitat. And plant systems obviously combine to make habitats as larger systems. But also, a plant contains subsystems. An example of a subsystem is the plant cell that itself contains a number of parts, but also itself demonstrates um, some functions that cannot be demonstrated by the nucleus or any of the other the membrane, any of the other parts of the plant itself. Um, 
And just to connect the idea of using socio-scientific issues in the classroom with the broad perspective of open schooling, there is a quote from Ewing and uh, Troy Sadler back in 2020 that reads as follows. In science classes, lessons often stop with using scientific systems to make sense of a phenomenon. So we devote in conventional science teaching, we devote a lot of emphasis on trying to understand a phenomenon. And one part of understanding the phenomenon is formulating a system that plays some part in that phenomenon. But if we want students to understand how science is used in the real world, how science works and how it benefits societies, and what the current issues are that they themselves, the students themselves, will encounter in the news, in their discussions, in responding to some of the challenges that they will encounter in their daily lives, um, we should make an effort to expand the use of systems beyond science. We should make the connections between scientific systems and social systems. We should connect what we are dealing with in the science classroom to community priorities. That is a call for using socio-scientific issues as part of connecting the school with the community and the community with the school. Um, why would it be valuable to teach on, on topics that relate to socio-scientific issues. Socio-scientific issues can help us to improve students' understanding. Uh, they can contribute to citizenship education and they can help students to make informed decisions, to empower them to participate in debates, to help um, students to be able to deal with complexity and to understand better how science works, the philosophy that underpins science and the practices of science. Um, with socio-scientific issues and exposing students to socio-scientific issues, it becomes possible to engage students with ethical problems, um, to engage them with, socio with scientific social and moral viewpoints, uh, to get them to experience conflict with their own personal views and the patience that that requires to weigh up the evidence, the scientific ideas, to make, to reflect back on our own viewpoints and how we could modify our own viewpoints in order to accommodate the scientific evidence and the scientific background. Um, giving students ex experiences with the need to focus on the use and interpretation of scientific data and analyzing conflicting evidence, uh, discussing, engaging with discussions of diverse viewpoints that might be different from their own starting base is a valuable, extremely important uh, learning uh, experience. It's important um, because it also develops open-mindedness, the recognition that any one of us has uh, prejudices, any one of us may be overgeneralizing from personal experience, and any one of us has learning opportunities, and we can benefit from learning as a process of modifying our starting position, our viewpoints, to become more closely aligned with the available evidence, with the scientific um, information that is accessible to us. So, Basically, socio-scientific issues and their controversies provide valuable classroom opportunities for engaging students in scientific thinking through processes that involve cognitive dissonance. Um, there is science education research literature that has recorded teachers' and students' viewpoints on working with um, socio-scientific issues. Um, some teachers say that they find controversies valuable for identifying students' prior knowledge, for, understand, for getting students to appreciate and understand different perspectives, um, for teaching social responsibility, for raising environmental awareness, for making topics more interesting, 
for connecting with real world examples, uh, but also for making more visible in the classroom the need for collecting observation and data and for methodically analyzing scientific evidence in the form of observation and data. So getting students to engage with the scientific process of collecting information, making sense of the information, analyzing it, and using it to formulate scientific claims. Many teachers report that socio-scientific issues are a good framework, a good context for achieving that. Um, Socio-scientific issues also can lead to engaging discussions, uh, promoting dialogic arguments, an understanding of the role of communication in the nature of science, the importance of uh, the, the importance that scientists attach to communicating the outcomes of their um, work to the uh, science community and to the public, and of course, making um, more more clear in the classroom the realization the, the value realize appreciating the value of developing robust conceptual understanding and what the uh, applications of that might be in analyzing phenomena that's an important aspect of that's an important advantage of using socio-scientific issues they also offer a means of expanding both the curriculum and the range of teaching practices that are commonly experienced in the school science uh, classroom. They are um, a good context for reforming science education to make it more relevant, sorry, more relevant uh, to the teachers and the students. So to give one initial example, I will take global warming because it's talked about a lot at the moment, it's part of the international discourse for policy making. One, one interesting aspect of global warming is that it's a clear cut issue that cannot be addressed at national level by any government. It's a clear cut issue that requires supranational structures or at least consistent collaboration between the governments of many countries if we are going to respond to the challenge, uh, if we are going to get to a situation where human life on the planet remains sustainable. So what might be a, a, an educational activity sequence for um, using global warming as a socio-scientific issue in the classroom? I will, in these next two slides, I will outline a skeleton of a set of activities that one might uh, use to work with their teachers in a, let's say, in a middle school classroom. Um, just to give you an idea of how uh, this could be arranged and how one could go about dealing with this example of a socio-scientific issue in a science classroom. So a first activity might be asking students to search for scientific information, not any kind of information, specifically scientific information on global warming. And the instruction here interprets what that might be, interprets the term scientific information. So it asks students to find data, to find arguments, structured arguments, to find models and the predictions that come out of models. So three kinds of scientific information data or evidence, arguments, and models and the predictions that come out of those models to collect information relating to those three and to work in groups of four in order to organize, analyze, and present that information to others. So this is a, a, a data or a scientific information collection activity that engages students with the process of finding, collecting, organizing, and presenting scientific information. The second activity that follows from the first, is it gets students to work, it gets a classroom of students to form new groups. So originally they would work in groups of four, 
we divide those two into subgroups of two, and then we mix them up into new groups of four, where only up to two students could have worked together in the previous group. So it's a remixing of the students into new groups or heterogeneous groups. And we ask each of these groups to identify a controversy in relation to global warming. One controversy might be, is global warming produced by people or is it natural? Another that was discussed in the media very heavily intensely about 10 years ago, that controversy, I think in scientific circles, is now set settled. In political circles, not so much. Another controversy might be, again in relation to global warming, does it make sense to invest in nuclear power plants for electricity generation in order to limit uh, global uh, warming gases, the release of global warming gases in the atmosphere or the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? That's another controversy. There's a number of others that relate to different priorities for creation or the adaptation of societies to changes in relation to global warming. So identifying a controversy uh, and collect, finding information, summarizing that information, uh, summarizing the various positions around the controversy, and presenting the scientific evidence that supports or refutes each of the positions around that controversy is the second activity. Again, work, students work in groups for the second activity. In the third activity, students keep in the same groups and they present their controversy and the underlying scientific information that relates to every aspect, every competing position around that controversy in the form of a poster the class organizes an exhibition of the group posters and the students develop, work together to develop a rubric for assessing other groups' posters. So there's a peer assessment activity there. So to summarize on this slide, three activities. One is collecting scientific information with emphasis on what makes information scientific and what doesn't. Organizing it, analyzing it. Second activity is identifying a controversy, finding information um, that relates to the different positions on that controversy, and presenting it. The third activity is developing a poster on the controversy, the different positions around that controversy, and the information that supports or refutes each position, and developing a rubric for evaluating other students' posters. Um, and on this slide, instead of continuing the sequence, I give you a number of options. Uh, students could engage with a role play activity, a role play game, where one group adopts the role of politicians, another ro the role of oil company executives, another the role of environmental activists, and another the role of citizen groups. And they develop, um, as they, they assume the role of each of these stakeholders and they develop positions about what they expect of each other uh, in terms of policy priorities. Um, another possibility is to engage students in the formulation of uh, possible options for policy action involving small and medium enterprises or industry local communities, households, and citizens. Uh, of course, if you look at the literature and if you look at the current policy development at European level, all of these people have ideas about what others, other groups, other stakeholders should be doing. They have fewer ideas about the responsibilities that they have and what they could change for themselves in order to contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation processes, uh, getting, these, getting students to adopt these roles and think about how to negotiate policy priorities would be a very interesting scenario. 
Developing arguments in favor and against different options is another context, is another um, frame for uh, getting students to develop their argumentation competence. Argumentation is an important aspect, an important practice in science, and a valuable goal for inquiry-based science education. Organizing a classroom debate that can lead to recommendations for decision-making where people um, verbally promote against each other the different policy actions that they would favor, they present the evidence and the argument projecting why one option might be better for the future compared to another option, what group of options might be favored with respect to other groups makes for a valuable reach and interesting debate. Some students might engage with it for and the time to develop their understanding of the different issues that relate with global warming. Um, reflecting on aspects of the nature of socio-scientific issues might be another activity that would be part of this activity sequence. So raising issues such as, given the example of global warming, what is uh, a socio-scientific issue? What might be other possible examples? What was challenging during the work on global warming and what was easy, uh, was it interesting, what made it engaging, what made it interesting, and so on. That might be another set of activities. And this gives me, um, gives me a connection to move to the uh, next part of the presentation, which, uh, where I want to discuss the idea of reflection. What is reflection? What is its relevance to education? and how can we nurture it if it's an important priority for students. And I want to do that in connection with inquiry-based science education. So I want to also make the connection with uh, talking about uh, reflective inquiry or reflection in the context of inquiry-based science education. Um, on this slide, there is a quote from John Dewey back close to hundred years ago. Um, and it, this is an interesting quote. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. So experience is important for developing our mental wealth, for um, constructing meaning for our learning processes, both as individuals and in our interactions with other people. Experience is important. It provides a basis on which to construct meaning. But of, of itself, it is not enough. We need an, act, an active mental process, an interactive mental process, some people would say, of reflecting on that experience before we can make sense, before we can develop meaning, before we can use that experience to develop our knowledge. And uh, John Dewey provides um, his definition of what reflection is. Reflection is the active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the grounds that support it and the further conclusions to which it tends. So basically, he says, reflection is secondary thinking about what we know and how we have come to know what we think we know. It is also active, a form of active thinking about the implications of what we know. So, thinking about what we know, how we have come to know, how, how reliable is the base on which we we relied to formulate the meaning that we think we know. And if we are confident about with what we know, what conclusions, what implications, what, what, what can we do, what actions can we derive from what we know, all of those are instances that make up reflection. Reflection is a thought process that helps us to think about what we know, 
how we have come to know what we think we know and what we can do with what we know based on uh, John Peter. Um, in the context of education, reflective teaching practice is a dialogue of thinking and doing through which I become more skillful as a teacher is what uh, Donald Sean is saying here. So uh, the aim of any reflection as a teacher is to engage in deep thought to gain better understanding of an issue, event or encounter and how we deal with that issue, event or encounter in our classrooms. Reflection is about asking questions to do with the why and how we go about doing or thinking about something. And we can think in teaching and learning, we can think about reflection as part of what we do and separate from what we do, reflection on what it is we have done and what we intend to, to do as a follower. So teacher's reflection can be um, a process that, that can be individual or collaborative. We can reflect with other teachers or with other people. We can reflect as individuals. Um, the content of reflection can be on our practice in the classroom or it can be on the content of our teaching. It can be phenomenological, for example, on the nature of science and the nature of science teaching and learning or the nature of the background content in which we teach and what we know, what we don't know, what we would like to know more, what people have known about the topic and how they have used what they know about the topic. All of those can be parts of the content of reflection. And the object of the reflection can be ourselves. We can reflect on what it is that we know in our head. On, or we can reflect on how we interact with our students, what it is we know uh, or we understand about an individual student or a group of students' work, their thinking, their effort, their progress. All of those are aspects of um, a teacher's reflection that tend to take place as part of our daily lives, whether we call it reflection or not. A large part of our thinking is about what we try to do, what we have tried to do, and implicit in that is our intention, our background knowledge, our professional knowledge, our pedagogical knowledge that supports how we design our activity, how we, how we examine back what was successful and what was less successful about our activity and how we would like to modify our future activity. And in practice, uh, it's possible to go about reflecting in a number of ways. And all of these ways are possible to introduce into the classroom to help students to learn to reflect about their own thinking. So reflective journals or reflective writing can be one tool for recording our reflection and anal analyzing our reflection across time. Reflective discussions can be a context through which we interact with others uh, to engage in communal, in uh, discursive reflection. Um, it's important to expect for our reflections to impact our practice. And modeling how our reflection impacts our practice is an important, valuable lesson for our students. So making it a habit to reflect through thinking aloud and through explaining the implications of our reflections on what it is that we do in our classrooms or we expect the students to do in our classrooms is an important aspect of practically introducing reflection in our classrooms. Um, representing the content of our reflections, reflective writing was one representation portfolios, drawings, concept maps, mind maps, any kind of representational tools, pictures even, that help us illustrate our reflections for ourselves and for others can be useful practical tools for uh, strengthening our personal reflections, but also for nurturing students' reflections and, and engaging students in the process of thinking about their own thinking. 
So uh, some of the common features of reflection, this is also quite useful in getting students practically to engage with reflecting, describing an event or an issue, ascertaining our feelings about that event or that issue, evaluating what happened in that event or evaluating different aspects of that issue, analyzing um, the process, the event, the issue to make sense of it, summarizing the event or the issue for somebody else and selecting what are the crucial features, the crucial aspects of that issue that are important for somebody else to know if they are going to appreciate our interest in that issue, forming an action plan based on that event or that issue and leading to a process of relearning about the event or the issue or taking subsequent action about that event or that issue. All of these are important aspects of reflection and they can be used as cues, as um, starting bases to get people to reflect on a particular issue or on something that they have been doing. How does all this connect with inquiry? Uh, we've explained already that um, inquiry-based learning involves the active engagement of students in um, working with scientific evidence to develop their own meaning, their own claims, their own arguments, make the evidence with the claims, their own knowledge. As part of conducting that collaborative project of learning, it is useful for students to engage in processes where they plan what it is they're going to do. While they are doing it, they have tools in place to monitor their own progress. And also they go back to evaluate the extent to which they have been productive, they have made productive use of their time, they have been effective in making progress, they have made progress in developing their understanding. So as part of, uh, as part of inquiry based teaching and learning, reflection takes the form of planning, monitoring and evaluation activities. Integrating planning, monitoring and evaluation activities into the activity sequence is an important part of what a teacher can do to support students in making their inquiries more reflective, in making their inquiries as a result better designed, more thoughtful, more structured, more methodical, more likely to lead to valuable learning outcomes. Enriching the inquiry activities to make learning more robust, more long-lasting, can be done through reflection. Reflection on what we have learned and achieved up to now, why that is important for the overall goal of what we are trying to do, for example, of uh, what we are trying to do with the socio-scientific issue that we are grappling with, and what can be interesting for next steps. What, how we can plan our next steps so that we have progress based on where we are at and the goals, the objectives that we are trying to meet. So the claim here is that inquiry, inquiry-based learning in science, nurtures the habit of reflecting for the students. Basically, it introduces students to the value of reflecting for themselves in groups as long as we take care to introduce planning, monitoring, and evaluation activities as part of the student projects, as part of the student-led collaborative inquiry projects, and for the purposes of this presentation in the context of socio-scientific issues. So reflective inquiry is a style of inquiry, it's an approach of inquiry, it's, a, it's, a, an, it's one, interpretation of inquiry that encompasses both effective inquiry strategies such as the systematic collection and interpretation of scientific data and reflective activities, monitoring, periodically evaluating uh, our progress and revising our plans for the future. This is again a call by Law and others back in 
2001. One way to represent this, one way to think about this, is that inquiry-based science education activities uh, can take the form of identifying and identifying phenomena, issues, making predictions as to how those phenomena or those issues might evolve in the future, um, organizing, observing, measuring scientific information, collecting scientific information, classifying, comparing, contrasting, communicating, debating, discussing, and within that, taking the time to plan what we intend to do and why we want to do it, introducing tools and time to monitor the extent to which we have made progress in what we have planned to achieve, and evaluating that progress uh, and identifying what to improve in future steps are all different types of activities that can help us to have holistic, reflective inquiry with socio-scientific issues. So in a nutshell, in order to introduce reflection into uh, inquiry-based science education, we would like to introduce activities for creating a record of progress, to ask reflective questions about what it is that we are planning to do and how it is that we are going to implement that planning. Asking questions about how we will know whether our plan is proceeding, proceeding successfully, reviewing and reflecting where we are at, revising our strategies to improve progress toward the goal, and finally communicating our progress and how we, what we feel has gone well and what we feel needs improvement is an important part of the reflective process. Providing and receiving feedback is part of the evaluation aspect of reflection. So planning, monitoring and evaluation activities can be very useful in introducing reflection and in helping students to develop their reflective capacity as part of their inquiry-based learning. Some important questions. What are, the, what are the basic questions that we would like to explore as part of our inquiry? Why are these more important than others? What is the key background knowledge that we need to identify, understand, and use in our inquiry? How will we know that we have adequate scientific evidence? What form is that scientific evidence taking? How and in what ways does the change made in the experiment, in the observation, in the protocol for collecting information in our inquiry more broadly, influence the findings and our conclusions from them? What is the evidence telling us? What interpretation of the results presented by others or ourselves are we familiar with? Which parts are we not familiar with? Which parts do we have enough evidence to refute? Which parts can we confirm based on our own evidence? Those are important reflective questions that help our inquiry to proceed, that help our in inquiry to, um, that, that help our group to know where we are at with our inquiry and how to, how to continue where we are at. Um, is this a good time to take a short break? Is it good to take a short break or are you okay for me to continue? So what do you think? Um, well, uh, well, I, uh, uh, it's hard for me to say because uh, the, the 90 minutes has already passed. Uh, no. Uh, yeah, so, um, so maybe, I mean... Would it be useful for me to um, identify the examples that I was going to suggest that people can look at? Uh, I think we will share the presentation anyway, so people will have additional information. And wrap it up that way, so that people can devote some time to do the questionnaire. Is that okay? I guess. 
but it, maybe we can ask to the to the participant. But I, if somebody thinks it's not a good idea, please you can write in the in a chat. I I believe yes. So, but I think it could be a good idea. Okay, I don't see anybody even starting to write, so I guess that. So I wanted to show you this representation. Um, it's from an approach to reflective inquiry that uh, was used to design a tool called Progress Portfolio. And in this work, they identified a number of um, aspects of the classroom environment that have important implications for engaging a student or a group of students to reflect on their own work. One was understanding the background uh, domain, the attitudes and the beliefs of the students, interacting with other students, interacting with the learning materials, interacting with the teachers, uh, uh, but also self-regulation and motivation strategies all of these aspects were found to be important in engaging students to reflect on their work so that was one item that i wanted to identify um, uh, before i move on to either to uh, naming the examples um, the first example I wanted to identify uh, relates to an issue I described earlier, the issue of um, uh, squirrels. Um, there is a published teaching learning sequence uh, from the US on the issue of too many deer in a residential neighborhood and what could be done about it. Um, this is um, this is um, this is part of the work that was developed by the West Elman Woods Nature Preserve in Indiana, in the U.S. It's an area with about a quarter of a million residents, and they discussed very openly whether they should um, develop a public policy to kill deer or to uh, force deer to move to other areas. Uh, that was discussed openly. It's one socio-scientific issue on which there exist teaching and learning materials that you might find useful as an example for introducing socio-scientific issues in the, in the classroom. Um, another issue that I, pro that I identify as a second example is the idea of a community or a government intro introducing a tax on the consumption of foods that are very high in sugar content or in fat content. The idea would be to encourage people to make more optimal nutrition choices and uh, promote this as, a, as an action, as a policy for preventative medicine, for helping people avoid future health problems. Is that a good idea or is it not a good idea? Is the science clear cut or not on this issue? This is an important, for sugar especially, it's an important current uh, dilemma, controversy in the context of nutrition. Um, a third example for which there is published um, curriculum is on the issue of water pollution in uh, Lind River. This is um, a tweet from Michigan National, identifying back in 2016 that the National Guard was called to assist Michigan with toxic water uh, in drinking water. They found lead. This is uh, picture shows local residents uh, with water coming out of their tub. Um, there was an issue with the maintenance of lead pipes. Uh, they wanted to shift to 
the, the local community wanted to shift to another supplier for drinking water. As part of making that shift, they decided to introduce water from a river. Uh, as part of that change, the, there were chemicals in the water that interacted with um, old lead pipes, and they ended up with contamination both with lead and with a number of chemicals and bacteria. Um, um, people suffering with lead poisoning. The socioeconomic background to that story is interesting in itself. The chemistry is interesting. Uh, the background science is accessible. And there are teaching learning materials. There is a complete description on YouTube. Let me give you the connection if you would like to um, see that. Um, I don't think. Have another example that I want to talk about, but I would like to say this before I close. Um, three important elements of teaching with socioscientific socio -scientific issues, and I am uh, quoting here and taking information from two papers back in 2019 is that they are very useful for nurturing the competence of argumentation, formulating relevant questions and developing social scientific reasoning and systems thinking, and for engaging young people in active and responsible citizenship. Those are important priorities for any modern science um, curriculum. And I would encourage you to engage with them as a process of exploring how we can all shift our practices and how we can help in uh, enriching our curricula in order to take on the goals of promoting more robust competencies for the future of young people. So, in that sense, I'll finish with the motivational side. Uh, summary and power our students with the magic of scientific exploration, teaching real-world challenges not only sparks curiosity, but also mirrors the dynamic reflection of a teacher shaping future critical thinkers and responsible global leaders. That's part of the value of working with socio-scientific issues. And I remind you about the PAFSA project. This is the website. You can find many, many teaching and learning resources on public health education, on connecting with communities, on engaging with public schooling. It's a nice project with practical materials to engage with. I would encourage you to keep in touch when we announce our um, online professional learning course. You'll find it interesting. And this is the link to the background questionnaire. So I, sorry I took more of your time than I wanted to. And thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Kostas, very much for a very inspiring uh, talk. Uh, uh, I also wanted to, uh, to say, just before uh, we will maybe go to, to any questions, that, uh, that the link to the question we would like uh, you to maybe answer and provide us feedback is in a, in a chat. Also in a chat, if uh, anyone would be willing to ask uh, any questions, you are more than welcome. And uh, just on the top of uh, everything that, uh, that was said today, Maybe I would uh, love to, to add that on PAF's uh, uh, website, there are many uh, scenarios uh, that can be, that are related to socio-scientific issues and that are using uh, reflective inquiry as a, as a practice. So, uh, so, if uh, any of you would like to take a look and um, and make a closer uh, relationships with these scenarios or see how it can be implemented, they are on on the website. So, uh, 
so so really everybody is uh, welcome and uh, while maybe we will be waiting for the uh, for the any questions uh, because so far we have uh, just thank you uh, uh, the information and the messages from from the chat i just wanted to to ask one question um, because uh, of course usually um Socioscientific issues are ill-defined, they are very open to interpretations. Uh, but how do you uh, how do you recommend to the teacher to uh, to deal with the problematic situation with uh, students who are very strong in their opinion, which opinion is not scientific, yes, stays in the contradiction to scientific evidence how would you approach this uh, maybe do you have uh, any recommendation for that situation um, the value is in the process the value is in encouraging everybody not just to express an opinion but to explain their reasoning and then to prioritize people's reasoning with respect to whether they include scientific evidence and a logical uh, argument, logical reasoning that connects the evidence with the claim. So basically, the idea is to use the process to nurture a culture that privileges scientific thought, that privileges the value of science. Um, and you can only you can only be effective in that if people experience it, if people uh, connect it with their personal lives and they recognize that choices that are science-based are more likely to solve problems, are more effective in sol solving problems, are more likely to meet human needs. Another aspect of um, Introducing socio another advantage of so introducing socio scientific issues in the classroom is that because you you're dealing with an issue that is an issue of relevance, you can make those connections. You can illustrate that science based solutions are more likely to work. And you need to trust the process. You need to you need to have an open mind. You need to encourage everybody to have an open mind. And you need to privilege documented uh, viewpoints with respect to viewpoints that are not reasoned out, that are not documented, that do not have support from 